Dr. Greg Jones, a mastermind, a poet. Rugby player, throw it. Looking like Chris Pine, you know it. <laughs> Academic, reenactor, put him on a farm, he drives the tractor. <laughs> or a factory, he'll own it. Want to do a big deal cross country, he'll telephone it. But don't phone it in. Oh. <laughs> this is Greg Jones. 2005 graduate of Geneva College, um, 2007 graduate of Western Carolina University, and 2013 graduate of Kent State University. University. <laughs> His gradual gradations of graduations bring him here tonight as a professor of history and humanities. While at Geneva, he played rugby, roller hockey, sang in reflection, played trumpet, and baritone in the band, was a super fan and most importantly, met his wife, Jen. He lives in Ravenna, Ohio, with his beautiful wife and two exceptional children, Sadie and Silas. About Greg, I feel impelled to write a few lines that may be remembered when I shall be no more. I have no misgivings about or lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged. And my courage does not halt or falter. I know how strongly Geneva now leans on the triumph of dreams like yours, and how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and sufferings of old revolutions. And we are willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all our joys in this life to help maintain this Geneva and to pay that debt. Greg, our love for you is deathless. It seems to bind us with mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence could break. And our love for Geneva comes over us like a strong wind and bears us unresistibly on with all these chains to the battlefield. The memories of the blissful moments we have spent with you come creeping over us, and we feel most gratified to God and to you that we have enjoyed them for so long. This story will the good man teach his son, and the days will never go by from this day to the ending of the world. But we in it will be remembered, we few, we band of brothers. For he today who sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Hold, brother. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Greg Jones. start with the easy one because uh, this is it's just about death um, <clears throat> some of you I already talked to throughout the day that today uh, marks the 150th anniversary of the death of Abraham Lincoln uh, 150 years ago plus one uh, he was murdered in Fort Theater in Washington DC and um, I have the awesome opportunity in my life to, to study. Uh, I get to study history, something that I've loved since I was, I don't know about the naked dog part, but since I was <laughs> uh, And so, so it, it's, it's really, it's an honor. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, this, this is literally my dream job. Uh, and so when I had the opportunity to come up here and talk, uh, to read some poetry, I'll get to that. But I, I want to give this prose piece first. And some of you are like, I didn't sign up for an academic conference. And, sorry. Just <laughs> take a seven minute nap, you'll be fine. Uh, but for those of you that could potentially be interested in, in this, it's titled On Abraham Lincoln and the Importance of Reconciliation. Abraham Lincoln was one of the most beloved presidents in American history. 
he remains the second most written about person in human history, second only to Jesus. He commanded respect that caused 13 states to secede from the Union, and he stood for the ideology of free soil more than, more than abolition that nevertheless made him the linchpin for rebellion. Rather than regale you with a story of his quote-unquote greatness, I want to spend tonight the sesquicentennial of his death, uh, that means 150th anniversary, uh, talking about his legacy of reconciliation. From the time President Lincoln won the hotly contested 1860 election, he began thinking about how to put the nation back together. He knew that his divisive stance on abolition would upset the Southern firebrands. What is less clear is how much he knew about the pending war itself. He, like his colleagues in the House and Senate, were used to decades of vitriolic, hate-filled speech bouncing from north, uh, south to north and vice versa. Who of them knew the war would, quote unquote, surely come is unclear. Lincoln, it seems, feared the worst as he traveled to Washington to take up his position in the White House. He rarely left the Capitol in the following four years. We're familiar with a few of his stops, one to General McClellan in the spring of 1862 to hurry the seemingly slow-footed commander. Excuse me, another visit came tragically to the cemetery at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania in November of 1863. He visited few other places. He seldom left the, fort, the defenses and the telegraph lines of the White House and the War Department. Richmond, the capital of the rebellion, was a mere 108 miles away. The eminent historian James McPherson has argued that Lincoln was a bit too hands-on in his leadership decisions regarding the Army. He was an Illinois lawyer with minimal military background. He knew little about leading the 100,000 strong Army of the Potomac. Others criticized his leadership, calling him King Abraham I and other epithets, mocking his suppressive policies that protected the state of Maryland from secession. His detractors called him a tyrant, full of his own power mongering and desiring to squash the freedom of the southern states. He, of course, wanted no such thing. The free labor ideology, according to Eric Foner of Lincoln and his compatriots, mostly members of the newly rising Republican Party, were proponents of subsistence agriculture. They were farmers and supporters of farmers. Viewing themselves as more Jeffersonian than their southern brethren, Free labor settlers wanted to see the fate of the West decided by popular vote and the will of good, God-fearing people. They did not want the West to be settled by a slaveocracy that aimed to further its God-forsaken, violent, and backward way of labor. So why don't we remember Lincoln for his reconciliation? Why do we remember him as the sort of symbol of the Civil War? Well, because of what happened 150 years ago, last night. He was murdered before his vision for reconciliation could ever come to fruition. Not all historians would agree with this stance, but suffice it to say, Andrew Johnson's presidency did not take shape in the way that Lincoln's would have. Being a pro-Union Tennessean had garnered many enemies for the new commander-in-chief. Historians will never know what could have been with Lincoln as a Reconstruction president. We only saw him as a war president, and he has been judged harshly on that count. His words on reconciliation, though, were evident from the first shots at Fort Sumter. Rather than condemning Southern militants, Lincoln rhetorically refused to acknowledge the Confederacy as a nation. Which is pretty impressive that for four years he never acknowledged the Confederacy as a nation. He said, you're rebellious citizens. <clears throat> Instead, he emphasized that they were Americans. Wayward and rebellious, sure, but still Americans. And he did not crucify or vilify them. <clears throat> he sought to bring them back into the Union. When Benjamin Butler, the aggressive Union uh, general responsible for taking over the port at New Orleans, freed the slaves of Louisiana on his own, <laughs> which is kind of like, he was just like, yeah, you're free. <laughs> and everyone was like, you're a general, but you don't actually have the power to do that, right? And Lincoln was like, let's talk. Uh, Lincoln was uh, not at that point prepared to be the great emancipator. He thought that freeing the slaves at that stage would be 
divisive, would prevent reconciliation. And that was his, his hope, his dream, his desire. Instead, as is oft quoted, he was willing to save the Union if it meant not freeing, quote, a single slave. Then again, in that same letter to the abolitionist Horace Greeley, Lincoln also said that he would free, quote, all of the slaves if it meant preservation of his beloved Union. And that's the point of all this when it comes to reconciliation. Lincoln wanted the nation to be whole again. Historian Alan Guelza wrote a bio of Lincoln that called him the quote unquote redeemer president. And that redemptive lens is one that we might utilize more vividly, more distinctly in our own presentations of Lincoln. While he was certainly responsible for the command of armies, the use of the draft, and even the development of income tax. All sorts of relevance for today. His attitude toward reconciliation was consistent. And it burdened Lincoln's heart to think of the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Americans in the North and the South. Seeing that he didn't want to acknowledge the sectional divide, let alone two different nations, it's easy to observe his love for a nation that perhaps needed the war and his death to even create. There are many quote-unquote immortal words of Lincoln, some from the Gettysburg Address and many from his second inaugural. And they all revolve around this concept of reconciliation. He was deeply saddened by the division of the nation and sought to see it rehabilitated. He sought restoration. To quote from his second inaugural, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations." End quote. I'm not here to develop a hagiography of Lincoln. There's plenty of that to go around. But when it comes to legacy, he solidified it with the second inaugural. His comments were importantly not directed at the Yankees of the nation, or the rebels of the nation. They were to the nation. They were words intended to bring restoration. And Lincoln's call to restoration comes with two blatantly theological concepts, that of care for the underprivileged and a call for lasting peace. And those are gospel concepts. After witnessing widespread death and the overt failure of politics, Lincoln called his audience, the nation itself, to reconciliation. You see, I skipped a section of this speech, well, most of it, but in the section that precedes what I quoted, before these iconic concluding statements, Lincoln had not acknowledged, as the infamous John Brown had prophesied, whose image is right up here, in a famous sketch by John Stuart Curry. It's a picture of him looking like this. That symbol should mean something to most of us here. <clears throat> the price of the sin of slavery was a blood price, and it was being paid by Americans every day of the Civil War. And Lincoln acknowledged that. So I stand here tonight humbled to address this body of scholars, students, and fellow Christians in the hallowed halls of a Christian college whose very roots were in the Underground Railroad. Few of you know that a mere 75 feet, about that direction, actually, down in the basement in the archives, there's a letter from the John Brown. I'm not making this up, this is not a joke. There's a letter from John Brown in our archive, addressed to the Geneva College president in 1859, proclaiming his thanks for the support that the Covenanters gave him. I've seen it several times. <laughs> that, dear friends, is why the legacy of Abraham Lincoln ought to matter to this college. Why, thank you, we got to hear the bells a few days past. His presidency and eventual reconciliation vision were the fruition of what covenanters and abolitionists like them set out to do. 
They were countercultural. They were willing to cause division to bring justice. Because, if you'll allow me to quote a few hymns, in Christ there is no east or west. There is no south or north. And it did take the Union Army to, quote, tramp out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. But let me remind you, as Howe and Lincoln might have 150 years ago, that his truth is marching on. Glory. Hallelujah. So that was section one. There's basically three sections of what I'm going to present tonight. And uh, that was like the serious academic theological part of me. Uh, this middle section is going to be a little more uh, about me as the Geneva guy. Uh, and you, you heard in the brief bio that I graduated from here in 2005. And I, I really have a deep love for the mission of the college. My life changed. You know, God changed my life through this place and through a lot of important people here. Um, so that said, this very first poem that I'm going to read has nothing to do with that, uh, but it didn't fit in any other section, but I really like it, and I want, I want to see if you like it. So if you do, let me know. Um, if you don't, maybe you can help me make it better. Uh, this is called New Bohemians. Some of you will relate to it, and others of you will think it's a waste of time. You New Bohemians have broken into the mainstream and betrayed your kind. What it means to be you is to redefine beautiful, to tra transcend that noble dream and exit suburbia. Young, beautiful Bohemia, write the essays of academia, purse the wet lips of anarchy, and kiss away. Bold, arcane Bohemians, come back to the fold again. Return to those deep countercultural roots and strum a new tune. Dancing naked beneath onyx sky, bohemian rhapsodies let the people fly, soaring above the maniacal fray, and let the wind cry, Mary. Be not enraptured by the Midas touch, let not wealth entice too much. Dance alone, dance with friends, and celebrate the essence of life. So the next three, um, the next one is about Geneva. And it's, uh, I would venture to guess that every single person in this room knows the symbol that I'm going to talk about. It's called a view from the seal. The seal in John White Chapel, right? And I thought, what would it be like if that seal could write a poem. Here it is. <laughs> year after year, generations of emerging minds come and sit here. They listen to professors, they jot down notes of Michelangelo, King Lear, Nebuchadnezzar. <coughs> Students walk en masse, sitting in special desks designed for learning, hoping their attendance will help them pass. And to what end? For the, God, for the glory of God, we say, writing and reading will help us ascend. The view from up here is pretty grand. There are now former students teaching current students. Pro Christo, more students again and again. That'd be me, right? I'm going to walk. Excuse me. Now, this next one is a little more bitter. That, that last one was like, I don't know, quaint. Uh, but this one is a little more bitter. And it's not bitter towards Geneva. It's not bitter towards the, the, that situation. 
Uh, it's bitter towards uh, higher education. So, sorry. Um, for the industry, though, it's not about the school specific. Um, and, it, and it's actually written out of some angst uh, that's not my own. It's kind of collective with people in the same, the similar position as mine, um, with a job market that is different than it was 20 years ago, and certainly 50. called Professions Promise. You will be something. You can make a difference. New life, changed lives. Your work will mean something. To line the pockets of a chosen few. There's no money left for me. No contract, no benefits. They're not even sure they can find me a desk. Half-functioning ne'er-do-well support staff cackling at my meaningless degree, subtracting the student loan money. I'm nothing but a literate surf, the best kind. I suffer from foot-in-door syndrome and believe chronically in the optimistic promise of my profession that one day or every day there will be room for me to profess. I obsess on this point until my dreams bleed and my eyes twitch. I edit my research, believing it to be the anchor to my free sailing. But the reality is far more grave. There is no ship. It was an empty promise. And now I'm awash in a sea of debt, and the life preserver says, adjunct. Mm -hmm. This one's promising again. <laughs> it's called Home Calls Us In. And uh, I'm not very good at metaphors, so we'll see how. <sighs> Broken bottles, shards of glass strewn about, vestiges of destruction. From what was once a celebration, turned into desolation. How a party turned into a fight, no one really knows, but it happened, and now we wonder how it came this far. What are we really fighting for? Don't lose sight of the mission. Stay the course, fight the good fight. The mission calls louder than the din of the crowd. Follow the beacon, see it out there in the distance. Let's get the crew together. Land ho, we're almost there. Save your punches for another night. Home calls us in. Oh, that was the title, Home Calls Us In. <laughs> uh, so the last section, there, there's just three more, so hopefully you can bear with me. Uh, but in this last, last section, um, Beautiful, thank you. Uh, in this last section, uh, they're called Letters from Ravenna. Um, and Ravenna is the town in Ohio where I live, and most, I think all of these I actually wrote at home, which is different than uh, some others that were inspired that I've written here. Uh, and this one is the most juvenile, uh, but it's also just sort of absolving, I don't know, me 15 years ago or something like that. And it's called to the haters. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this one goes out to the haters, to the ones who doubted me, to the ones who tracked me into re remedial classes, to the ones who mocked me for being different, to the ones who didn't understand my intelligence or my humor or my big open heart, to the ones who mocked the way I marched, to the ones who teased me for dreaming, to the ones who doubted my ability to run the race set before me. This is not my life to live. I lost my life many, many years ago. Thank you, haters, for giving me reason to keep my headphones on and block out your insults. Thank you, haters, for criticizing my genuine thoughts, which motivated me to think and to read and to work even harder. Thank you, haters, for doubting the way I could love and be loved. You make me pour into the brokenhearted with greater vigilance. That's not a word. Vigilance. <laughs> Uh, thank you, haters, for, my help, for halting my dreams and calling them impossible. You pushed me to pray harder, to seek more, and to pursue my king with increasing vigilance. I don't hate you, haters. I pray for you. 
I pray you will find the lasting peace of the loving God that I know. I pray that you will find your soul in the arms of the creator of the universe, the king of kings and lord of lords, the infinite God who breathed a finite creation into being. I pray that you will find restoration in the broken relationships that led you to hurt me. I pray that you will find loving family to embrace you. I pray that you will find redemption personified in the personhood of Christ and know that you need nothing else. I pray that your story is filled with purpose and blessing beyond what you could ask or imagine. I hope my haters become lovers. I pray that all haters become lovers. Join in the angel band, dear friends, for the tune is eternal. Sincerely. The only thing I had to remember to bring with me was Kleenex, and I didn't. So uh, these last two are going to be hard to read in front of other people. Uh, I have a two and a half year old daughter. And uh, that's, that, that's a real one right there. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, her name is Sadie, she was mentioned in the intro. Oh, and Megan brought a whole box, so thank you. Uh, this is called Dear Sadie. Uh, we'll see if I get past the second paragraph. Today you're two. Soon you'll be 10, then 16, then 21. But today you're two, and I love you more than words. Just tonight we had the most beautiful time getting a bath, reading a story, and saying prayers. When I tucked you in, I gave you two hugs and some bonus kisses, which you request by calling them bonus kisses. <laughs> when I look at you, I see beauty and truth. I see innocence in the midst of a world that is generally chaotic. You are, I think, going to be a difference maker. And I don't know how God will use you, but your mother and I have been praying for you for years. You're an inspiring and beautiful young woman. Your heart for your family and for loving people is evident and exceptional, and it's an honor to be your father. I hope you never stop running into my arms. Tonight, you said, Dada, get me. And it was the thrill of my day. Your giggles are infectious, your hugs are delightful, you are a special girl, and I am so thankful to be your father. You learn new concepts and words every day. We listened to some music tonight, it's one of my favorite things to do with you, and I hope someday we can share a love for music. It speaks to my soul in important ways that I can't describe, and based on the way you look and seem to feel music already, I think you get it too. And that's really exciting for me. I look forward to sharing much of life with you and can't wait to see where God takes us, Father and God. I hope we'll have many, many dances today. You are a blessing and a gift. You are the perfect image bearer of the perfect creator. You are a daughter of the king and therefore a princess. You are not my princess, but God's. You are my sweetheart and my little love. You are my first little bear and one of the smartest people I know. And I know a lot of people with PhDs. <laughs> <laughs> More than anything, you have a heart that exudes the love of God. I hope not a day of your eternal life passes without you feeling the gracious love of a good and just God. That's my prayer for your life, that you come to a saving knowledge of Christ and that you dedicate your life living for and loving Him. I will always have hugs and bonus kisses for you. Always. Oh, Dad. And if you can imagine it, uh, this last one is going to be harder to read. I can't even see the time. It's 
called Do Dr. Matt. Dr. Metz and Bose was, uh, my favorite isn't really the right word for it. Um, he was a really good professor and a, a historian and sociologist who was largely responsible for shaping the way I literally see the world. Um, and my intellectual formation, my spiritual formation, Dear Dr. Matt, this is a hard letter to write. I don't know much about the connection between heaven and earth, but I wanted to write to you anyways. I should have done it years ago. Thank you for teaching me about life and history. Thank you for pointing me, pointing to me in class and helping me engage. That's a story you have to ask me sometimes. <laughs> Thank you for encouraging me to leave home and pursue grad school. Thank you for the books. Thank you for making me think. You taught me how to think differently about the world. You taught me compassion and intellectual curiosity were not mutually exclusive. You taught me that teaching women in Iran was a noble act. You taught me that the end of the Cold War was not, in fact, the end of history. You taught me that for every thesis, there's an antithesis, and when we continue to pursue this dialectic, we eventually come to synthesis. You also taught me to reject the old adage that history repeats itself. It doesn't. I'm glad to have learned that in my own work. Thank you for standing up for me when I stuck my intellectual neck out and a professor threatened to chop it off. That was Dr. Nykirk, for, if, if we're naming names. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, he meant in good fun, but uh, Dr. Matt defended me. <laughs> Thank you for introducing me to one of my historian heroes. Thank you for being one of my historian heroes. Mostly, I guess, I'm just sorry I didn't write to you sooner. I'm sorry I didn't have more conversations with you or buy you coffee. I'm sorry that I thought I was busy when I probably wasn't. But I want you to know that I continue to work in your legacy and educating young minds of Geneva. I don't know how long it will last or what influence I will have, but I'm working according to the promises of a good and just God. You taught me about that God in so many ways over the years. The last time we talked teaching, you told me about your life experience with victory gardens and rationing in World War II. It's a pretty remarkable life. I thank God that in all the cosmic coincidences and happy accidents of this temporal existence, we got to cross paths. I'm glad you're not in pain anymore, and I miss you, your student, Greg. Right.